Everybody else, welcome, <clears throat> and happy Mother's Day to all of you who made it out this morning. There are plenty of donuts and treats left for you, so please take those home with you, uh, because Timmy is on a diet, and he didn't want to eat them. <laughs> I have no clue if Timmy's on a diet at all. <laughs> Doesn't need to be, look good. Hezekiah was the son of a wicked king who reigned over Judah for over 20 years. Unlike his father Ahaz, Hezekiah was a, a good man. In 2 Chronicles chapter 31, verse 20, it says that he did what was good and right and faithful before the Lord. But at one point in his life, Hezekiah became very sick. Isaiah the prophet told him to get his affairs in order. Didn't look like he was going to recover. But Hezekiah prayed for God to be merciful. And uh, the Lord sent a message through Isaiah. It's recorded in 2 Kings chapter 20, verses 5 and 6. And here's what it said. Tell Hezekiah, I've heard your prayers. I've seen your tears. And I will add 15 years to your life. And I will defend your city, Jerusalem. When Hezekiah got well... He wrote a poem that is recorded in Isaiah 38, verse 9 through 14. In, my prime, in the prime of my life must I now die and be robbed of the rest of my years? Never again will I see the Lord while in the land of the living. Never again will I see my friends or be with those who live in this world. My life has been blown away like a tent in a storm. Suddenly it's over. I waited patiently all night, but I was torn apart emotionally as though by lions. Delirious, I chattered like a swallow and then moaned like a mourning dove. My eyes grew tired of looking to heaven for help. I am in trouble, Lord, please help me. Maybe you have felt like Hezekiah did at one time in your life where you just were, you needed help. You needed God's help. One translation put it like this in verse 14, Lord, I am overwhelmed. Please come to my help. A lot of things can overwhelm us. Grief, guilt, grudges, worries, responsibilities, and circumstances. And since this is Mother's Day, I thought what we would do is we would take a look at the most famous mother that ever existed, Mary, the mother of Jesus. And how she handled the things that came into her life that seemed to be overwhelming. You remember her story. It's recorded in Luke chapter 1 beginning in verse 26. It said, God sent the angel Gabriel to a virgin named Mary. She was engaged to a man named Joseph. And Gabriel appeared to her and said, Greetings, favored woman, for the Lord is with you. Confused and disturbed. You might want to not forget that. Mary tried to think of what the angel could mean. Don't be frightened, Mary, for the angel told her, for God has decided to bless you. Now, when all of this happened, I want you to understand that Mary was just a young teenage girl, 15 at the uh, most, uh, but she was young. In those days, uh, marriages were arranged. Uh, and arranged. And when it says that, that she was engaged to be married, uh, uh, Joseph had probably... Uh, Mary had probably been picked out uh, uh, for uh, Joseph, and so this was an arranged marriage. And by the time you were 13 or 14, uh, in that time, you were already married. So this was just a young teenage peasant girl. One day an angel shows up. I want you to get this story and picture it. An angel shows up and says, hey, Mary, I know you've never been with a man, but guess what? I need to tell you that you're pregnant. <laughs> you're going to have a baby. And by the way, it's the Lord's. Uh, 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 how would you react to that kind of news? I can imagine Mary's mind racing and her thinking, how in the world am I going to explain this? Uh, who's going to believe me? And, and probably running through all the implications that were in front of her of, of what she's just been told. How am I going to tell Joseph I'm pregnant? Obviously it's not his, but it's kind of his. And, and he'll understand. No, he won't. Yes, he will. No, he won't. What am I going to do? How am I going to convince him that it's not what you think? I don't think she was too excited about having that conversation. How am I going to tell my parents? Mom, Dad, um, I'm pregnant, but it's, it's not Joseph's. It's, uh, well, it's, it, it's God's. Right, honey? 
right, honey. We love you. We love you anyways. <laughs> she had to deal with all the implications of this news that the angel told her. Joseph's probably going to disown me and leave me. My parents are going to doubt me. The community is going to disgrace me. My reputation is shot. And in those days, you could be stoned by immorality. So she's thinking, I could lose my life. This is a disaster in the making. And remember, she's just a young girl. So when the Bible says that she was confused and disturbed, brother, she was confused and disturbed and I would be too maybe there's another way for us to describe it she was overwhelmed she was overwhelmed let's pause for a moment and think of all the things that Mary must have been dealing with there was the 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 fear of criticism what's ever got everybody going to think of me there was a fear of the supernatural I'm just a young girl and now I'm pregnant and I've never been with a man and and I'm what what's going to happen inside my body and there's the fear of inadequacy I'm I'm supposed to be the mother of the son of God do you think inadequacy might have uh, welled up in your heart as well well absolutely and then there's the fear of change my life is going to be totally different from here forward and so to say that she was overwhelmed is kind of an understatement here in scripture but I have a question for you this morning what do you do when you're overwhelmed and by the way, has anybody here ever felt that way recently? What do you do when you're overwhelmed? What do you do? Hey, you do the three things that Mary did. And I don't care if you're overwhelmed this morning by debt. I don't care if you're overwhelmed by fatigue. I don't care if you're overwhelmed by stress or even the responsibilities of parenting. You do the same three things that Mary did when she got overwhelming news. And by the way, it's usually the opposite of what you think you should do. Mary was obviously feeling overwhelmed when the angel told her this news. Uh, but did you catch what the angel also said? He told her, Mary, you're going to be blessed. Here is the principle that I want you to get this morning. We usually feel overwhelmed uh, right before we are about to get a blessing. So if you feel overwhelmed this morning, do not check out because God might be preparing to bless your life. Somebody say amen. Amen. God might be getting ready to bless you. What do you do when you feel like your life is overwhelmed? Well, you do what Mary did. You let go first and foremost of the need to control the situation. Write that down in your outline. See, typically the more out of control human beings feel, the more overwhelmed uh, we tend to feel. And when we feel overwhelmed, what we do is we redouble our efforts uh, to try to control what's out of our control even more. And so we move into a hyper control and try to micromanage and use force or use wield a willpower to try to make things work. And people do it all the time. We do it all the time. Parents do it uh, with their kids when they start growing up and showing the first signs of independence. They think we're, gonna, we're, we're, we're not going to let this get out of control. Eh? We're not going to let this happen. And so we got to nip this thing in the bud right now. And they push it down and, and they put the offending child on restriction because we cannot let this get any bigger thinking that we got to control it right now. You know, I want you to hear this and hear me clearly. So much of the stress in your life is caused by our desire to micromanage everything in order to control things, in order to be the manager of your life. But have you, have you noticed that the more you try and the harder you try to control the things that are uncontrolled in your life, the more overwhelmed you feel? It's true. The more overwhelmed we get. The truth is, most of our life is outside of our control. And most of your life, you have not figured out and you're not going to figure it out. You're not going to figure it out. The Bible calls life a mystery. God seems to like it that way. You see, reality is God not only glories in revealing things, uh, but he also glories in concealing things. You see, God intentionally does not tell us certain things about life. Why? It's very, very simple, and here it is, to force us to rely upon him and to depend upon God Almighty. Amen? That's where God wants us. So there are things in life that you're just never going to figure out. and That means that you've got to learn to let go and of your need to control them. In verse 34 here of Luke chapter 1, after hearing the big news, Mary asked the angel, but how? How can I have a baby when I'm a virgin? I'm waiting. Anybody? How can I have a baby when I'm a virgin? And the angel replied, nothing is impossible with God. Amen. 
And by the way, it's a typical reaction when you're overwhelmed, though, to ask the same thing Mary did. But how? How in the world am I going to get out of this debt? How in the world am I going to make this payment? How in, my wor- in the world am I going to get the things I need to get done, done? How in the world am I going to solve that problem? How am I ever going to be able to heal this relationship? When overwhelmed, we ad- tend to ask again and again the but how question. But listen, Mary didn't doubt what God said uh, through the angel. She never doubted that it was going to happen. She was just confused. See, when the angel said, you're going to be the mother of the Son of God, she didn't go, no way. She went, wow, how? And there's a big difference between saying no way and saying, wow, how? Amen? Come on now. Amen? Mary's going, how can a virgin have a baby? That's a great question. How can a virgin have a baby? People have been asking that question, by the way, for over 2,000 years. But did you catch the angel's response? The angel didn't stop. And give her a detailed explanation of how it was going to happen. He just says, hey, Mary, is anything too hard for God? And Mary pauses and realizes what Mary already knows. That no, it's not. Friend, God can do anything and everything. So don't sweat it. Just let go of your need to control your life. Amen. Hey, Here's the principle. Whatever is bugging you in your life right now. And it's bugging you because you cannot control it. You need to understand that although it is outside of your control, it is never outside of God's. Amen? It is never outside of his control. When Mary stopped and realized that, she stopped worrying and started trusting because she was able to relax in her spirit, understanding that God is in control. And her response when she relaxed in her spirit was instant and it was simple. Notice what she said in verse 38. After the angel told her nothing is impossible, God will do this. She said, Mary responded, I'm the Lord's servant. I'm willing to accept whatever he wants. Everybody, listen to that surrender again. I'm willing to accept whatever God wants. She goes, I'm, 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 I'm going to do it. May everything that you have said come true. Friend, the secret to finding peace when you were overwhelmed is learning to let go. I don't care what it is that might be overwhelming you. Let go of it and allow God to handle it. Mary said, I'm giving up control. I don't know what's going on. I don't know how you're going to do it, but I'm giving up control. I yield to you. I surrender to your will. I give up. And there's a word for that. It's called faith. Faith. It's showing faith. Mary's showing faith. She said, okay, God, I don't know what you're doing or how you're going to do it, but I trust you to do whatever it is that you think needs to be done in my life at this moment. And I want you to know that is a hard thing for human beings to do. It's a hard thing for us to do. Let's admit it, in a crowd even this size, in a crowd like this this morning, there's got to be some control freaks in here. Don't raise your hand or point to your spouse. Come on now. Hey, there's got to be. There's got to be some folks in here, maybe people just like you, who have this innate desire to control everything around you because you know that it would be better if you could be in control of it. And if everybody would just let you rule the world, well, then everything would be perfect. If your family would just do things your way, uh, it would be a better situation. If your company would do it your way, then your work uh, uh, site would be a better place. Human beings, we all have this need to control And when we look at things that we do not control or face things that we cannot control, it just bugs us to no end because we have this built in us, this need, this desire, this flesh uh, to control. Most of us have it. But there's a verse in the Bible for that, and God put it in here just for this purpose. Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 5, 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Somebody say amen. Do not depend upon your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him, and he will make your path clear. He will make your path straight. The message paraphrases it like this. Trust God from the bottom of your heart. Do not try to figure everything out on your own. Does it sound familiar? Does it sound familiar? I hope it does, because that's you. That's me. We want to figure things out. We do. 
And one of the most important lessons in to, uh, uh, to learn in life is that you do not have to figure everything out. Come on now. I do not have to have everything figured out in life. And when you try to figure everything out uh, and why God does the things he does, you're going to be severely frustrated because God cannot be figured out. He is much bigger than our brains can handle. And every time we try to figure out why God does what he does, you're going to be disappointed because God is not figure outable. It's not. So you've got to learn to let go of the things that might be overwhelming you this morning. Listen to what God promised in Psalm 138 and verse 8. The Lord uh, will work out my plans for my life. No, it doesn't say that. You see that top sentence there? Let's read it together. The Lord... Let's do that in unison, church. The Lord... Ah, the Lord will work out his plans for my life. Three things are three facts about God's plan for your life. God's plan for your life is often bigger than your plan because God has a bigger perspective than we have. All Mary and Joseph wanted to do was get married, settle down, put some meat in the crock pot, buy a condo, live a happy, healthy life. That's all they wanted to do. But God said, no, I've decided to bless the entire world through you, Mary. So hold on and get ready. Here we go. I'm sure you must understand intellectually that God wants to bless your life, but most of us really have no idea what God could do in our lives and through our lives if we are total, if we were totally, completely, and absolutely sold out to Him. And not just a part of it, but if every fiber of your being belonged to God and you said like Mary, Lord, whatever you want to do with my life, I'm willing to have it. Let it be done. Whatever you want, God, we have no idea what God could do in our life. Uh, God's plan is often bigger than our plan. But not only is God's plan bigger than yours, uh, God's plan many times is more painful than yours. Anybody expe- experience that? Okay, It's harder at times uh, to be a Christian than not. Sometimes it's downright difficult. It's often confusing and it doesn't make sense. Uh, certainly didn't make sense to Mary. Uh, the plan that God had for Mary's life was much more difficult than the one he, uh, she had for herself. Can you imagine the struggle that she faced. Can you imagine the gossip that she must have faced as an unmarried mother who claimed that God had fathered her child? I mean, in the world in which she lived, uh, I can imagine the ruthless criticism and the ridicule and the scorn that she uh, was going to face. And then days before the delivery, she had to climb onto the back of a donkey and travel for days in order to get to Bethlehem. Would any mom here like to confirm that that would be difficult, Jen? <laughs> Obviously, Brian saying, get on that donkey. Come, baby, come. <laughs> he asked me to preach that baby out of her this morning. He did do that. <sighs> and the day before you deliver, you take a donkey ride over a bumpy road for miles and miles uh, to get to where you need to go. Uh, it was incredibly hard. And then to get there and deliver your first baby without a mother, without, your mid- without a midwife, without a hospital or a doctor, and delivering your ba- a baby yourself as a teenage girl in a donkey filled with, uh, in a donkey, in a stable filled with donkeys and cows uh, and the smell of potpourri manure wafting through the air. That's hard. That's hard. And Mary must have thought a thousand times, why me, God, why? Why does life have to be so hard? Why, Lord? I've surrendered to your will. I've surrendered to your plan. Why does life have to be this hard? But what Mary didn't know is what God was doing. What what was happening was God was fulfilling a promise that he had made thousands of years ago when he said that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. But from Mary's point of view, uh, this thing wasn't thousands of years old. It just came upon her suddenly. And so if she looked at it just through her eyes, it could have looked uh, like possibly God was ganging up on her. And he ambushed her. And that God said, of all the girls in the world, Mary, I'm going to pick you and turn your life upside down. And you're going to be the vehicle that I use to come into the world and to bless other people. So to Mary, it was a complete and spontaneous surprise. But it wasn't. It wasn't. 
Because God had planned her story, her life story before the earth was formed. Because as you read the Bible, you see all the genealogies uh, that had been traced back to Adam and through Adam. And you see that, that, that the Messiah would come through the lineage of David. And you see that that, uh, uh, that, that uh, also involved Mary. So this was no accident. God had planned uh, what was going to happen to Mary uh, thousands of years before it happened to Mary. Point is this, my friend. Nothing is li- in life is an accident. Amen. Nothing in life is an accident. Nothing at all. There is a purpose behind every situation and every problem. And that means nothing ever surprises God. He knew everything that was going to happen in your life before it ever took place. Uh, Even the bad stuff. No, he doesn't cause the bad stuff. There's enough stuff in this world to cause itself. But he takes even the bad and decides to turn it around and make good out of it. Did God bring good out of the cross? Well, sure he did. Uh, uh, Did bad happen to his son on the cross? Well, absolutely it did. Did God stop bad from happening to his son on the cross? No, he didn't. But did he turn it around and make good out of it? Absolutely he did. Somebody give the Lord praise. Amen? Amen? Friend, nothing is by accident. God's plan for your life is often harder than your own plan for your life. But even though God's plan for our life is many times bigger than ours, and it's often more painful than our plan, you need to hear this and hear me clearly. God's plan for your life is always better than your plan for your life. Amen? It is always better. And that means uh, that when you get to the point where you begin to cooperate with God's plan for your life, then you can start to relax and enjoy your life uh, and stop being overwhelmed. Uh, Friend, God looks at life from an eternal perspective and not just in the here and now. So God will always sacrifice short-term comfort in your life in order to gain long-term glory. God will always sacrifice short-term comfort in order to build character in your life that's going to bless you into eternity. Listen to me. God is not interested in you being comfortable. God is interested in preparing you for eternity. And God knows what's best. And God loves you. And God knows what's good. That's why being overwhelmed sometimes can actually be good for you because it throws you to your knees uh, to rely on Almighty God. Somebody give the Lord praise. And that's exactly where God wants us, on our knees relying on Him. Since it's Mother's Day, let me ask you, how many of you who are parents have ever felt overwhelmed by the responsibility of being a parent? All right, three of you. We'll have a class down the hallway to help the rest of us afterward. I remember when Kristen and Ashley were born 26, 27 years ago. Did I get it right, Ashley? Okay, great. (laughs) Great. (laughs) 26 and 27 years ago, I remember holding our youngest little bundle of joy in our arms as she let out a scream and, uh, and, and wouldn't stop screaming. And I just remember holding Aisley there in my arms. And Kristen was a quieter baby. Aisley was noisy. I remember holding Aisley in her arms. And she's just screaming and crying. And I remember holding her thinking, stop, please. Stop, please, stop. <laughs> and... Uh, From that moment right there, I realized that, you know, I learned I couldn't control her. Oh, I tried for the next 20 years or so. I tried. But she got a will of her own just like her, just like you and me and her daddy does. And one of the most difficult things in life is learning to let go of your kids when they grow up, especially when they make painful choices. I'm still trying to learn to do that. Okay? It's not easy to do. The second thing you need to do when you feel overwhelmed And the second thing Mary did is you need to learn to let others help you out. If I want to go from moving to feeling overwhelmed to finding peace, I've got to let let go of control and begin to let other people help me out. 
And again, it is, it is the opposite of what people tend to do. See, when people get overwhelmed, what we tend to do is we start withdrawing from people and withdrawing from relationships, and we start pulling back and trying to isolate ourselves, uh, and we get this feeling of, leave me alone. I don't want to be around anybody. Let me cry in my beer. Let me hunker in my bunker. And I'm telling you, I've seen that a lot over the years in my, in my ministry. When people start having problems in their life, they start pulling out of church. Did you know that? When people start having problems in their life, they start pulling out of church or they start pulling out of a, a small group or they start withdrawing from friendships and walking away from the very thing they need most in a crisis, other people. We need other people. Somebody say man. We need other people. But here's what Mary did. Verse 39 a few days later, the Bible said she didn't waste any, mo- any time. She didn't waste a minute. She went to Zechariah's house and greeted Elizabeth. Now, Elizabeth was the cousin uh, of Mary, but that's not important. What's important is what uh, not who Elizabeth was, but what Elizabeth was. Uh, she was married to Zechariah, who was a priest, and she was a godly woman. So she could pray for Mary, which was a good thing. And second, she was an older woman which meant she had more life experience uh, so she could give wise advice to Mary, which was a good thing. And third, she was also pregnant with her own miracle baby. She was unable to conceive uh, throughout her life, but God made it possible so that she could become pregnant through her husband, not a a virgin birth, but through her husband, and she was carrying Jesus' cousin, John the Baptist, uh, and she was six months pregnant. So not only was she wiser and older and godly, but she was a little further down the road than Mary was. Mary was brand new pregnant. Elizabeth was six months pregnant so she could help her younger sister, uh, cousin go through this situation because she had already been there. Here's the point. When you're overwhelmed, uh, you need to find an Elizabeth. Everybody needs an Elizabeth babbler in their life. I pitched you a softball, right? <laughs> Good thing you hit it. Everybody needs an Elizabeth in their life. What's an Elizabeth? Well, here's what you look for, friends. First, got to find somebody who's a strong believer. Somebody who can be your spiritual partner and mentor and friend throughout life. And two, you got to find somebody who's a little older than you. Because when you find somebody a little older than you, it means they've had a little bit more life experience than you've had. And three, find somebody who's just a little further down the line uh, spiritually. They don't have to be f- perfect. In fact, you will never find a perfect spiritual partner or mentor. But you can find somebody who's a little further along than you are and they can help you out. Here's the point. Here's the point. Uh, everybody needs somebody like that. Okay, And not just in marriage, not just in marriage. I'm telling you, men need Christian men in their life. Women need other Christian women in their life. Guys need a guy partner, and women need a woman partner. Ecclesiastes 4, 9, and 10 said this, Two are better off than one, for they can help each other succeed. If one person falls, the other can help out and uh, can reach out and help. But someone who falls alone, that person is in real trouble. God says you're better off to have a friend than to be all alone. And it's one of the reasons why we also need a church family friend. uh, And you need to be connected to a group of people within that church family. uh, uh, Like maybe people that you've grown close to it. Maybe a Bible class that you've joined or one of the small groups that we plan to launch this fall and it's why I'm never going to stop talking about those things because it's not enough just to come to service and hear somebody preach or teach you've also got to get around people who are living the Bible so that you can live it with them somebody say amen okay we've got to do discipleship together you've got to get connected with some people preferably before that crisis of life happens you need to get connected before the inevitable problem, inevitable problems uh, that come in life come into your life. The reality is you're going to have loved ones and friends that are going to die on you. The reality is you're going to face illnesses. The reality is you're going to experience a financial crisis at some point in your life or a number of, a number of other kinds of crises. So you need to get connected before it all happens so that supports that 
that that support system is in place when it does happen. You know, when I'm out in the foyer talking to people after service on a Sunday morning uh, and somebody starts telling me their problems, one of the very first thoughts that comes to my mind is that is exactly why we need small groups because you need a support system around you or you uh, because you need people to help you out. You need to be connected with other people. You see, you've got to be connected to feel connected. Think about it like this. Everything you're going to go through in life, somebody has probably already experienced it in this church. Everything that you are going to experience, somebody has probably already went through it. And that means that they can help you if you get to know them and if you build a friendship and if you have a trust with them. And that's what small groups is about. It's about helping us to get connected. And I will go as far as to say this. If you claim to be a Christian, fellowship is not an option. It is commanded. Paul said in Galatians 6 two, share each other's burdens and troubles and so obey the Lord's command. So it's a command uh, we're to share. And it's also that golden thread that runs through the great commandment to share each other's burdens, to love on each other. God said, love me with all your heart and love on each other. And when you're sharing your problems and your burdens and your troubles with one another and, you're, and they're sharing theirs with you and not just at an informational level, but personally to encourage one another, to challenge one another, to strengthen one another, you are truly and in a very, very practical sense, loving your neighbors yourself. And God has commanded that Christian people do that. Friend, you were not meant to go through life on your own. None of us were. So I encourage you to begin to start taking seriously uh, the importance of people around you. And begin to develop the relationships that you need now. Get connected before the tough times uh, come into your life. Here's the third thing you need to do when you're overwhelmed, and Mary did it as well. You let go of control. You let other people help you, and you let God give you the strength. Write that down if you would, please. You know, most of us know that God will give us his strength if we ask. The problem is uh, that we ask, but we don't really want it, okay? We don't really want it. We want the problem to go away, but that's all we want. We don't want the strength in the problem. We want the absence of the problem. See, instead uh, of seeking God's strength, we act. As if uh, it all depends upon us thinking if my problem is going to be set fixed, well then it's up to me. Uh, if it's to be, it's up to me. And we convince ourselves that God helps those who help themselves. Uh, and let me educate you on that. God never said that. Benjamin Franklin said it. God never said that. In fact, neither of those statements are in the Bible. If it is to be, it's up to me. And God helps those who help themselves. Those do not exist in the Bible. God says the exact opposite. God says, let me help you. Because it's not up to us. It is up to Him. Somebody give the Lord praise. It's always been up to Him. Friend, there are over 7,000 promises in this book. And hundreds of them where God says, I'll help you. If you call on me and if you let me. And we need to plug in to those promises of God. The reason why this young teenage peasant girl named Mary was not blown away by the overwhelming circumstances in her life is that she was a woman of the word. She knew the promises in the word of God and she stood on the promises of God. For in, for in verse 45, talking about Mary, it says she was blessed for believing that the Lord would keep his promises to her. Mary was calm and composed uh, in the midst of her promises, uh, problems uh, because she had the promises of God in her heart. And that is what gave her strength. One of the promises that you need to hold on to when you're overwhelmed is this, Isaiah 43 and verse 2. When you pass through deep waters, I will be with you. Your troubles will not overwhelm you. When you pass through fire, you will not be burned. The hard trials that come will not hurt you. The truth is, uh, in our own strength, uh, we may drown 
when the floods come into our life, but not in God's strength. Uh, so where do you get the kind of strength that Mary had? Because that's the kind of stuff I want. That's the kind of stuff I need. Because I've been in that valley of the shadow of death. I've been where I felt overwhelmed. I've been where I cannot do anything but cry and shake. I've been there. I've been there. And where do we get the power to get out of there we're in the, when we're in the midst of there? Well, I'll tell you where you get it. You get it the same way Mary got it. You do the same two things she did. Number one, uh, you find it by praising God for His goodness. Somebody say, man, I want you to know, friend, there is incredible power in the life of a Christian when we praise Almighty God. There is incredible power when we praise, incredible energy when we praise God. Every week I sit in front of a computer and write what you would consider a 15 to 20 page book report to be turned in to the, at the end of the week called a sermon. And when I do that, I can tell you that that is, a, that is a labor of love. It takes me two to four days uh, to do that. Sometimes uh, from the time I get up in the morning until the time my wife gets home from work or sometimes I'm writing into the evening and editing and writing and editing and writing. And I can tell you that I am not, uh, I was not made to sit in front of a computer like that. I was made to be with people. That's how God made me, okay? But if you've ever written on a, on, a, on, a, on a deadline, you know that sometimes when you're doing that and you're under pressure, sometimes for whatever reason you can get mental, mental block, you can get brain block. Anybody been there? And you're just writing and all of a sudden there's nothing happening and but halfway through the day you're sitting in front of your computer screen and all of a sudden you go blank and, and you stare up and you're looking for an ant on the wall that you can talk to, you know, or something else that can distract you. It's one of the reasons I bring my dog Toby to the office one of the, uh, all the time. He is a great conversationalist. Come on now. That's a good dog. But I find myself many times overwhelmed during the sermon writing process. Yet I know that God has called me to do it. So I keep on doing it. And sometimes when I'm in the midst of those brain blocks. Sometimes what I do is I stop and take little praise breaks. I'll stop and I'll get up out of my office. And I'll walk out here and I'll grab a guitar. And I'll just start playing a song and I'll start praising God. I'll start singing to the Lord. I'll just stop and stop and do that. And it helps me to get my eyes off the problem and on to the solution. It helps me to get my thoughts off the circumstance and on to the Savior. And it helps me to refocus myself on Almighty God. Try it when you get overwhelmed. Try it. Stop and praise God for His goodness. Mary did. For the Bible said in verse 46, she says, Oh, how my soul praises the Lord. Oh, how my my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. The other way you find strength when you're overwhelmed is by thinking on God's Word, meditating on God's Word. Mary did that as well. For in chapter 2, verse 19 of Luke, it says, Mary quietly treasured these things in her heart and she thought about them often. If you read the rest of that chapter, you'll see that Mary goes on to write a song to praise the Lord. And when you read it, you'll know that this was a woman who knew her Bible. This was a woman who knew the Old Testament because she quotes it extensively in her song, even referring to the song of Hannah. So Mary knew theology. Mary knew uh, her Bible, and she was intimately acquainted with it, and she shared what God had done for her. Now, why is it important uh, for you to read and study and memorize and meditate on the Bible when you're overwhelmed? I'll tell you why. It's important because this book helps us to sort out what's important in life. Amen? Amen. This is where you find out what's important. You see, the reason we get so overwhelmed in life is because we tend to treat everything we have in front of us as of equal importance, uh, and it's not. You have a list of things that you've got to do in your life, uh, and some of them are very important, and others of them are less important. Here, like this one. Try this one on. How about living for God? That's pretty important. How about loving my family and my friends? That's a big one as well. Well, you know what? We ran out, so we need to pick up some toilet paper on the way home from church today. Well, that could be moderately important, but it's not important as loving God. Amen? Okay. Uh, how about cleaning the house or cutting the grass? Well, uh, that can wait. Point is, 
those are not all of an equal importance. And what happens when you look at all you have to do is you start to get overwhelmed. Uh, but the truth is, there's only a few things in life uh, that really have to be done. Most of what we think needs to be done is not going to matter a week from now, much less into eternity. And, and, and so knowing the Bible helps us to clarify our values, solidify our priorities, and discover what's important. And that makes my life a lot simpler. These two things that I mentioned, praising God for his goodness and thinking about God's word, are guaranteed to get you out of your overwhelming circumstances. They always work. You just got to work at them. You got to work at them. As we wrap this up and the band comes uh, to get prepared to sing uh, our invitation, I want to encourage you, if you're facing anything in your life right now I want to that seems overwhelming, I want to tell you that God loves you. I'm not a mama. I'm not a mama. And most dads try to help, but truth is, uh, many times we don't carry the burdens that mamas do. We try to help, and we say, we love you, baby, and this and that, and when we walk over here, next thing you catch us in the garage or someplace else, right? Mamas have a special kind of, a kind of thing that they carry, a special kind of, yeah, and they just carry it with love, uh, but sometimes it can feel overwhelming. Wherever you're at in your life, I want you to know that God loves you. God is with you. Trust me. Trust me, he knows best, and God can be depended upon. I have experienced, as I said, the valleys of the shadow of death. And as someone who has been called to walk in that valley, I know for certain that where there are problems, there are also opportunities, opportunities to overcome and opportunities for victory. No doubt there are people in this room today, whether they say it or not, who are feeling overwhelmed. No doubt there are. You may be overwhelmed by fatigue. You may just be flat out exhausted and tired. You may be overwhelmed by loneliness and there's just an aching inside your heart. Were there any a number of things that could be overwhelming you regardless of what it is? You take these steps that Mary did. Let go of control. Let other people help you. And let God give you his strength. And if you'll do those three things, I'm telling you, you will find yourself developing the heart and the attitude of Micah, the Old Testament prophet, who went through a period of despair and said this in Micah 7, verses 1 and 7, I'm overwhelmed with sorrow, sunk in the swamp of despair. But me, I'm not giving up. I'm sticking around to see what God can do. I'm waiting on God to make things right. And let me tell you something, God will make things right. Somebody say amen. Bow your heads in prayer. Amen. Father, I pray for those who feel overwhelmed with responsibilities and time demands and deadlines. I pray for those who are weighed down this morning by worry and plagued by problems. Help them to experience a new strength and a new energy today. Now you pray. Father, I know that I need to stop trying to control the uncontrollable. It's a waste of time. So once again, Lord, I'm letting go and asking you to take charge of the situation and take control of my life. Lord, forgive me for the times that I act like it all depends on me when it doesn't. Help me to let go of my pride and allow other people to help me. I want to be connected to your family so I can receive support and give it to others. So help me to remember to praise you and to focus on your word when I'm overwhelmed. In Jesus' name, amen.